Can How We Breathe Help Protect Us Against Coronavirus? Today I'm speaking with Dr. James Metz, one of the world's leading researchers on sleep apnea. Dr. Metz and his colleague Dr. Zheng Hu Lin, one of China's top ENT doctors, they believe you can reduce inhaled viral count by as much as 50%. And you're about to learn how right now. And now, Amazon number one best-selling author, Dr. Tom, the Jim's Guy, Orant. Dr. James Metz's research has been published in the medical peer-reviewed Frontiers in Neurology. He's served on the board of directors for the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. He was the associate director of the Sleep Medicine Fellowship Program, OSU Wexner Medical Center. Currently, he is the chair of the Dental Interest Group for the American Thoracic Society. Jim, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with me today. I, I know you've been burning the candle at both ends. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Tom. And thank you for asking me to be here this morning. In this time of coronavirus, nasal breathing gives you a level of protection that you don't have by breathing through your mouth. We don't always have a mask on or we don't have a mask. Well, nasal breathing gives you sort of a mask. It's not perfect but it does help. Jim, this is such an important concept. Let's jump right in. Thanks again, Tom. I wanted to go through it first. The practice of nasal breathing, it has universal acceptance in the ENT community. Breathing through the nose is the healthful way to breathe. But why don't we? Utilizing the nose, this is what we're going to talk about mainly today. But we're also going to talk about decreasing the number of breaths that you take, which decreases the amount of inspired air, which helps decrease the number of viruses that you come in contact with. And lastly, I'm going to talk about taping at night. But the big thing is, what it all boils down to is improving your sleep quality. This will improve your sleep quality dramatically if you practice it. It takes a little work, it takes a little time. This may decrease the chance of exposure by up to 50%. And my motivation for learning nasal breathing was climbing the mountain. It's all about improving your sleep quality, totally. Sleep is incredibly important and the quality of sleep will give you a healthier way of life. It's interesting, my friend is Lin, uh, from, uh, he lives in Beijing. He's a very influential ENT within China. And he and I both believe that this method may decrease the chance of exposure by up to 50%. Now, it's the filtration and it's the nose that I talked about a little bit earlier, but it's also about improving sleep quality. People who are healthy do not get as many disease processes going on as people who are unhealthy. And healthy sleep does matter. What caused me to do this? Well, it was this crazy mountain. It's called Mount Rainier. And I wanted to get to the top of it. I'm 72 years old. Nasal breathing can reduce exposure to antigens by at least 50%. And it's free. Whether you have a mask or a bandana or you just have your nose, you always have that nose as a filtration. And if you do have a mask or a bandana and it slips sideways or tends to leak, you still have your nose. We have been developing this protective mechanism in our bodies for probably millions of years. So utilize it. Don't breathe through your mouth. It gives basic filtration the nose hairs. And it adds nitric oxide to the air we take into the lung, which is incredibly important. Nitric oxide is only produced in the nose not in the lung or anywhere else. It won the Nobel Prize in 1998 for its discovery as a signal molecule for the body. What is a signal molecule? Well, it kills most all bacteria and it lowers blood pressure by dilating the peripheral blood vessels. But the other thing is, this is a big one. It causes the hemoglobin in the blood to release more oxygen. Well, we have circulating oxygen, but our body cannot access it. But if you breathe through your nose, the nitric oxide facilitates the transfer of oxygen into your tissues. The best drug on the planet is oxygen. The more oxygen your body has to utilize, the healthier it is and the more cells that can repair. 
So you know, the defensive mechanisms of the body are really heightened with high levels of oxygen. Thin uh, and thick mucus or mucin. That's the covering, it's a sticky covering of your lung and your airway. Well, thin is good and thick is bad. And I'm going to provide uh, Tom with a, with a reference on this as well. But it preserves the bodily fluids by breathing through your nose. You get less evaporation of the water with nasal breathing, which spins the use in the airway. I see people in the gym all the time. They're carrying around the water bottle. They're mouth breathers. And they're sucking in all that air in the gym through their lungs, through their mouth, without any filtration. Drink plenty of water before you go, and then breathe through your nose. So, so Jim, just if I could interrupt, I get it. It makes a, a whole lot of sense, but conceptually, even if somebody understands it, how do you get people to commit to that type of a change? The only way that you can commit to a change is to have a goal. It's a goal that you want for yourself. I wanted to be able to get up a tall mountain. I wanted that more for health than for anything. And if I felt I could get up a tall mountain, I was healthier. That's my way of thinking. And I spent a lot of time doing that. I spent a lot of time in the gym. I spent a lot of time running. I spent a lot of time going up steps. And I try to always be a nasal breather. The goal today is not to get sick. This is a protective mechanism. The goal of this video today is to teach you a method of keeping yourself healthy, even after this virus thing is gone. But while the virus thing is here, it could protect your body from getting sick. And I feel that's a great goal for you to make for yourself to learn how to breathe through your nose only. I'm going to give you several ways to do that. But for right now, just know my whole reasoning behind it is your health. And you're a healthier person, and every ENT will tell you this, if you breathe through your nose rather than through your mouth. If you preserve the fluids, and you're not breathing through your mouth, and you're not having to carry a water bottle with you all the time, and you're breathing through your nose, there's less evaporation of the water with nasal breathing which thins the mucin in the airway. The airway becomes less, thick, less sticky with thin mucin, and it opens more easily. Thick mucin is very sticky and restricts opening. It's like glue. Once your airway closes, it does not want to open again, and you have to force it open. Making it thin is very helpful in this time that you, if you would contract a virus, to keep the airway open and breathing. Thick mucin carries bacteria more easily than thin mucin. The bacteria can hide within thick mucin, and it can't hide it as easily within thin. There are no blood vessels or whatever in the mucin to get rid of this bacteria, so it just stays there. So you can help yourself by just creating less evaporation within your, within your airway system. Bacteria's antigens cannot hide in mucin is thin. The big thing is, though, people breathe more slowly through their nose, and thereby less air comes into the body, which decreases the exposure. This is really important. It's just, it's just probabilities. If you only take in 70% as much air, you have 30% less chance of taking in a virus. But I wanted to do it for, again, this is before I ever knew of the coronavirus, was to get up a mountain. And so I spent time in Bhutan. And that's where this picture was taken in the little town of Leia, northern Bhutan. It is one of the most remote places on earth. It's a four-day walk to get to Leia. I wanted to see why these people lived. I wanted to see how they breathed. And so I, I went there specifically for that. One is they breathe about half the rate that we breathe, and they're predominantly nasal breathers. It shows the health. I believe this mechanistic society we have, the iPhone generations and all that, creates a lot of anxiety within us, and we tend to over-breathe. Over-breathing is to our, totally to our detriment. Breathing in more air gives you less air. This is my friend Frank Seaman on the right. Frank is my climbing buddy. It's interesting, Frank is quite a scientist. And what do we do for three days while we're climbing this mountain? All we talk about is breathing. We talk about breathing for three solid days. 
his practices in Silverthorne, Colorado, and he teaches people to breathe at higher altitudes. He hammered it into me about this nasal breathing. I thought he was crazy, and I resisted it. I just did not want to go to the work of what Frank was going to to breathe through my nose. How did I convince myself? This is called a high-resolution pulse oximeter. It records to the tenth of a percent accuracy, and that running through a software called SatScreen. This was originally brought in by Fleury uh, in, in chest in 2004, and I feel this is critical. And if you really want to understand this, you have to own uh, an oximeter. And I published that paper in Frontiers in Neurology. I will send a link for the newer oximeter. This is the oximeter on my wrist. And if you look, I'm at approximately the same altitude, 9,700 feet. It couldn't record my oxygen level, which probably meant that I was below 79%. After I started breathing through my nose, I got up to 90%. And I got to realize that 95 and above is really normal, but at higher altitudes, you tend to be a little lower. But when I breathe through my mouth, and then I'll talk to you about uh, breath holds a little bit, I could get my oxygen to 93%. And this is, this is within the same day. This is the same day, same time. And I just tried these different methods and to show you what was possible. The oxygen desaturation curve, I realize this is getting fairly technical, but I, I really want to bring this up because you need to understand it. And I, I put a good link for that down below. And the oxygen that you see on a pulse oximeter, say it's, uh, it's, it says 98%. What does that really mean? It really is based off of a curve we call the disassociation curve. And it really means what is the oxygen available to your tissues? You know, what is the tissue level? Well, in this case, 98 is 98 because we're on the normal curve. Now you notice there are two other curves on this graph. There's one to the left and one to the right. So let me draw a 92 across. Well, a 92, which is a little on the low side, instead of being, we just did 98 and we, we had 98%, so you can see by dropping uh, 6%, we didn't drop 6% to our tissues. We actually dropped over 20% to our tissues. That is that is considered normal. If you're a very good athlete or you're able to really do this nasal breathing well, instead of getting to your body 72%, you'll get 90% because you're on this curve to the right. It shifts to the right. Okay, now let's look at the one on the left, down to 60. That's bad because your oxygen is only about 40% less than you had at 98, which is a problem. Now, what causes that? Well, it's called mouth breathing, especially at night. Mouth breathing versus uh, closed mouth breathing. The closed mouth breathing, you're on the curve to the far right. You're over here. On mouth breathing, you're on this curve. This is normal, say during the day or something, but at night you could be clear over to here. Well, what does that do? This blows off your CO2. You can't hold on to CO2, and as you don't hold on to CO2, the curve shifts to the left. And I realize this is a little complicated, but it, it's thoroughly documented in the medical literature. So if you learn to breathe through your nose, keeping your mouth shut, you can shift this curve to the right. I always thought that I breathe normally. I always thought, oh heck, you don't need to learn how to breathe. I know how to breathe. I had no idea how to breathe. And once I learned how to breathe, I conquered Mount Rainier. And until I learned how to breathe, I failed. It's a learned skill. So there's a 50% difference here between a nasal breather and a mouth breather. So CO2 is gold. So preserving the CO2 inside of you, which is something different than we've always been taught, is what you really want to do, at night especially. What I wanted to talk about was taping your mouth shut at night. There's a couple ways to do it. One is with the 3M tape, the blue tape in the middle, and, and it says it's for sensitive skin. But there's many people that if they put it on their mouth like this and tape their mouth shut, they, they really, it irritates their skin. My friend Frank, he developed lip seal tape for people who are allergic to the tape or it bothers them, and especially women. 
it can really, uh, even the sensitive skin take. So his comes off very easily. It's hypoallergenic. It's available. A couple of things. First of all, I'll put a link uh, for the lip seal tape. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below. So if anybody would like to uh, take a look at that, you can click on that link below. Um, and um, my, my question, though, is regardless of which type of tape you're using, what about patients who have some level of, of claustrophobia? How, how do they deal with that? Oh, Tom, yeah, that's an interesting question. Claustrophobia, you would think that would be a problem. It goes into the same category as gagging, in my, in my estimation. A gag in claustrophobia is when you're protecting your airway. So people who are claustrophobic generally have a worry about being able to breathe. And they think taping their mouth shut would cause this to be a problem. It's really interesting. When you can breathe and get oxygen, the claustrophobia goes away. It, it's all about worry about getting oxygen. And if you get oxygen, you don't tend to be claustrophobic. So I'll talk about that more at length here in about two slides. Thank you, Tom. So nasal breathing improves. There's improves your sleep, daytime alertness, focus, attention, and nose breathing reduces snoring, dry mouth. It's really important to use lip tape while you're awake to confirm that you can use it that it's going to be effective and your nose works well enough to accommodate to the tape. So what I would recommend doing is putting it on and sitting in a chair for about an hour or watch TV or whatever you're doing and, and just see how you get along. You're going to be remarkably surprised. Warning, do not apply this when you're sick or having a cold, if you have an upset stomach, if you're taking sedatives or narcotic medication, after drinking alcohol, having difficulty while using a tape while awake. So never do it when you're awake. In other words, if you have, you're already into symptoms, this is not the time to use it. Just breathe through your nose normally and keep your mouth shut. But if you have difficulty breathing through your nose, talk with your physician about nose blockage. Frank, use lip tape for sleeping. And sleeping goes into three. Uh, really four categories. Less than five over here in the corner is considered normal. The number of times you essentially have a, a breathing problem at, at night, uh, less than five per hour is considered normal. Five to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and greater than 30 is severe. We looked over here and this first woman, Wanda, she's a 50 year old female, and with no tape, uh, uh, she was a nine. And with tape, she was at five. After 15 months of using it, with no tape, she was a two. And with tape, she was a zero. In other words, she was nearly a perfect success at 100%. There's another person, Jason, 21-year-old male. He had a no tape 18, which is pretty high for a young man. And with the baseline eight, but over time, the body heals. What the tape does is sets up conditions for healing so that your body can, you can take advantage of your, of your restorative mechanisms your body has built in. But here's one that's pretty high. A uh, 60-year-old male had a 48 to start off with, and with tape, he went down to a 14, which is really great. So anyway, Frank has the only literature on this that I know of. And this is Frank. He actually did the Pikes Peak Marathon with his mouth tape shut. He's the only person in the world that would try this. He's an incredible athlete, and he's, my, he's a real good friend. Here's another friend of mine, Patrick McEwen. I respect him highly. He is what I consider to be the world's expert on breathing. Patrick has a uh, tape black picture on the right. He lives in Galway in Ireland, and I spent 12 days with him, and he does phenomenal work with asthmatics. And uh, I feel... There's a lot to sleep and breathing through your nose that has to do with asthma, and Patrick is the expert on it. You can tell the difference between a mouth breather and a, uh, and, and a, not, and a nose breather. Patrick came up with this slide. Uh, you know, a nose breather has alert eyes, well-developed jaw, good size airway, straight nose, uh, good definition of cheekbone, straight teeth, and wider face. By contrast, a person who is a 
mouth breather tends to have a long, narrow face, crooked nose, set back jaw, smaller airways, crooked teeth, narrow face, poor definition, cheek, cheekbones, and tired eyes, but those are not sleeping well. So this is Patrick's slide, and I borrowed that from him. The control pause. This is how you can test your physiology. What it does, it's a very simple technique. You sit in a chair, you breathe in, breathe out, just breathe normally. Then all of a sudden, at the bottom of the breath, you hold your breath. And then you count, and you watch on, the, on your watch how long it takes before you start to get a tickle in the back of your throat when you really want to breathe. And when that starts to happen in, in a significant way, that, that's what is called your control pause. So that's a number of seconds. And most people would be less than 20 if you haven't been working with it. Uh, but and it's usually about half the amount of time that you can hold your breath. It's not how long you can hold your breath. It's how long until your body starts kicking in that you, can, you have a definite need to breathe. As we call it, a comfortable breath hold. So you record that time. It's important. So just breathe along and then breathe out, bottom of the breath, hold it, then see how long you can hold it. Breathe in through the nose and measure that time. Well, here's what you'll find. If you're, it's called your control pause. If it's less than 20 seconds, you probably have a blocked nose. You probably might have snoring, you might have insomnia, you might have fatigue, you might have coffee, wheezing, breathlessness, and exercise induced asthma. But if your control pause is 20 to 40, which is where mine is now, main symptoms are gone, gone but have symptoms if exposed to a trigger. But if you're above 40, very rarely do you have any symptoms. And this is in Patrick McEwen's book, Oxygen Advantage by Harper and Collins. You can, it's available on Amazon. So, Patrick, 42% greater water loss with mouth breathing. That's what I was saying. If you're going to the gym with a water bottle, stop it. It's not healthy for you. Everybody thinks that, that there couldn't be anything wrong with it, but that's not true. Uh, you know, mouth breathing gives you a dry mouth, cold hands and feet, yawn, and feel tense a lot of the times. Cold hands, cold feet, uh, it's really interesting. If you start nasally breathing just right now, just breathe in and out through your nose, and you'll notice your hands and feet warm up. It's, it's, it, it really is something. This is the Oxygen Advantage. It's available on Amazon. It's a great book. Chapter 7 is Bring the Mountain to You. I read it and read it and read it, and that's what got me up right here finally. Jim, um, we can put a link to that. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link uh, to that book in the description right below the video. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Well, let's, let me show you how to increase your control pause. This is really interesting. You're take, taking a walk through this nice woods. Well, let's say it's a sidewalk, and it has cracks in the sidewalk on out and they're all like 20 feet apart. Well, as soon as you walk over the first crack, you breathe out and you start holding your breath. And then you see how far you can walk until you absolutely are in need of air, but only to the point where you can breathe through your nose. You don't want to have to gasp through your mouth. And you count how far you get, how many steps, or how many cracks. And it's really interesting. In the beginning, most people can walk about 20 steps and they, they need breath to breathe through their nose. It's amazing. In about a week, you can easily get to 40. It, 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 the, you're resetting your, your CO2 thermostat in your body, and it becomes more tolerant to CO2, which is releasing more oxygen. So you, you go on and you do that, and you keep getting further and further and further. Let me show you what's possible. This is a 10-week period. In the beginning, the person could do 26. The end of week two, they could do 35. By the end of week four, they could do 47, 60, 69, 80, 80. Drop back a little bit because they backed off. 80 and up to 100. So they were able to do 100 steps in 10 weeks without breathing, without breathing by practice, practicing it daily. Like especially if you live in the city, just hold your breath. You can do it all the time. You don't have to be at a gym. 
You don't have to be in the park. You can do it walking up and down stairs. You can be walking up and down your hallway. You can do it anytime you want. I hold my breath all the time. And what it does, it teaches you to be comfortable with CO2. This is the way they train Navy SEALs to stay on the bottom of the uh, bottom of a pool for like four minutes. It's all about the control pumps. Bernoulli's principle. But why is this important? It's a venturi. And why is that venturi important? Well, if you have a small airway, like you have here in the middle, this is a small airway and it narrows, it creates a vacuum. What that does, and why is that important? Because you don't only get floppy on the outside as you get older, you get floppy on the inside. And so the Bernoulli principle really works against age. So this becomes more and more important as you age. When you practice any breathing exercise, it is necessary that you feel a hunger for air. You need to know that you really need air. You need an air hunger. And if you can practice living on an air hunger diet, it allows you to breathe at high altitude. And that's what really helped me on high mountains. Here I am with my mouth taped shut. It's here in, here in Columbus where I live. And uh, I, I did my whole exercise with my mouth taped shut. I'll ride my bike with my mouth taped shut. I know it looks a little bit weird, but uh, I try to, uh, you know, I just, I just don't pay attention, but I do this all the time. Here is the man that really taught me about that. This is young Bo Sherpa. Young Mo is an incredible individual. I, I really think very highly of this man. And he, he's a guide on Everest. He guided me on Rainier, and he taught me how to get up a mountain. He taught me what's called the rest step. If you want to get up a high mountain, you need to learn the rest step, the Everest step. And, but what he also taught me is, is never breathe through your mouth. He wears a, a, a buff all the time all the time. So it, even if he does let a little bit of air out through his mouth, he rebreathes it into his nose. He wants to increase his CO2. Piombo can summit Everest without oxygen. He summited Everest 12 times. This, he's an incredible individual. And, uh, uh, and the Sherpas, interestingly enough, and I did a long interview with him that was, I, I find it very interesting. But uh, I have it on video too, if anybody wants it. Um, but it, it's about uh, high cholesterol, uh, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. That's, the Sherpas don't have problems with that. And that's the reason why I wanted to go to Bhutan, because Yago is originally from Bhutan, and now he lives in Kathmandu. But um, uh, he lives in the United States more. But uh, it, it, was, it was about his ability to breathe and be able to be at altitude. And his Sherpa friends do not have trouble with the disease processes that we, that we encounter. But as soon as he moves to Kathmandu, the, the disease processes seem to be the same as in the West. Here I'm on top of Mount Rainier with my, with my guide this time, Yenbo. Great guide, but you notice we all have buffs on. He has his buff on. I have my buff on. Uh, <laughs> that's not for winter weather. It's to, it's to hold in CO2. Creating air hunger. When you lay down at night, and if you have insomnia, this is something that can really help. You breathe. You put one hand on your tummy and one hand on your chest, and you breathe really slowly and hold your point. Hold yourself at the point where you, um, you just almost need to breathe, almost need, but not quite. You can put yourself on air hunger. And I almost guarantee you within 10 minutes you'll be asleep. If you have trouble with insomnia, you have to calm down from the day. Well, what, does this, what does this air hunger do? Well, we have heard of the, the Buddhist and, the, and, and doing the meditations, the alms. The alms are really something. It's a nasal breath. You never breathe in and out through your mouth, no matter what your exercise or your trainer or your yoga teacher or whatever. In, 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 in the true philosophy of, of this, it's always nasal breathing. And um, I have a lot of mountain guys who say you need to do pressure breaths going up a mountain. Those are a, those are a um, sort of a half way nature to do the same thing, except they haven't trained themselves enough to be a pure nasal breather like, like the Sherpas do. But anyway, 
the 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 book the the monks sit there and they breathe very slowly. There's there's a man in Japan that can take one breath a minute. He breathes very slowly. And as they do that, they say their alms. And that vibration of the palate, uh, there was a, a researcher in Lundberg. Uh, he's in, I think, in Norway, if I'm not mistaken, but his references down at the bottom in 2008 showed that if you hummed while you breathe through your nose, you created 17 times the amount of nitric oxide. So when these monks gain enlightenment, they are really, truly gaining enlightenment. They're gaining enlightenment because their brain is oxygenated. So if you want to oxygenate your brain, give yourself a break and learn how to do this. Uh, I, I, I would love to hear from you. And uh, in anything I can do to help, feel free to contact me. This little boy was walking along by the ocean and these starfish had all washed up and they were all going to die when the sun came out because the tide had already gone out. And he was picking up one at a time and throwing it into the ocean, throwing it into the ocean. This man came by and said, oh, boy, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm saving starfish. And he says, well, you're never going to save them all. He says, he picks up one and throws it in. He says, but I can save that one. So if I train one person to become an easy breather, I've saved one. And I feel that's important. So let me know and use the comments below, as Tom said. And it's the starfish story. So Jim, what about people who have nightmares? Vivid dreams of nightmares. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. Whenever you remember a dream, you woke up during it. And there, uh, you won't remember a dream unless you woke up in the midst of the dream. So if I can keep you asleep during that dream, you'll never know you had a dream. What's interesting is the vivid dreams. There's three states of being, awake, asleep, and REM. REM, a different stage of being. Your brain is like the 4th of July, but you have trouble breathing during REM because the skeletal muscles don't work. The reason you woke up during REM is you can't breathe as well during REM. Nobody can because the skeletal muscles become atomic, they stop working. And you have less muscles to help you breathe. And we have a self-defense mechanism built into us called the fight flight system. The fight flight is what protects our lives. And so when it's afraid that you're not breathing, you're not getting enough air in, the body shoots a big shot of adrenaline and that wakes you up, that's the arousal. And, and you wake up during the dream and you remember it. So if somebody's having trouble with nightmares or, or night terrors or all those kinds of things, many people, if you can keep them asleep during that period of time, they don't remember that they ever had them. Most dreams are bad because the body is getting rid of, of bad data, so to speak. And so sometimes they're not indicative of your world at all. Um, uh, dreams that you wake up in what's called non-rim, the other kinds of that kind of sleep, tend to be black and white and very mundane dreams because that's delta or slow wave sleep. It's really deep sleep. And um, there's three stages of sleep, pretty much stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one is very easy. I'd say, oh, wake up. No, I wasn't asleep. You know, I was, I was awake, but you weren't. You were actually in the first stage of sleep. Stage two says, oh, I must have dozed off for a second. Stage three, you wake up during stage three in like a weird hotel room or something. You can't remember where you were. You know, I mean, you're really out of it. That is restorative sleep. That's where you want to live. Jim, question for you. A week or so ago, when you and I started speaking about nasal breathing, Elizabeth and I began uh, actually doing it, and it does take some getting used to, So, and I love it. My question is, on, on average, how long does it take to make it a habit so it's something you're much more used to? Tell them it's really something. I would say it took me it took me a while. It depends on how motivated you are to do it. The more motivated, the quicker you go, the quicker it will happen because you'll notice that your nose clears if you breathe through your nose. If you have a stopped up nose and you say, I never really want to breathe through my nose. If you can breathe through your nose for 20 seconds, Patrick says, I can teach you to breathe through your nose for the rest of your life. 
So even if you haven't stopped at nose, but you gotta work with it a little bit because the nose starts to clear, that nitric oxide starts to work and things start to happen. Um, I thought it was interesting. Um, I have a medallion that I wear around my neck. Uh, Lynn got it for me. It's from Mount Tai. And Mount Tai is in the sacred mountain in China. And I've worn it for years. And uh, it's relatively heavy. And it bounces against my chest. And in the beginning, every time it bounced against my chest, I thought, am I, am I breathing through my nose? And I catch myself not breathing through my nose. I'm instantly closing. If you if you um, move along and you're, you're in a grocery store or something, all of a sudden your mouth's dry, you've been breathing through your mouth. You know, when every mouth is dry, you're breathing through your mouth. So don't do that. Now, one thing that in, in a lot of places in Asia, and I think they do this in Bhutan as well, they teach their children to breathe, become nasal breathers because they know it's healthier. So what they do is they give them a button or something and tie it around their neck and they tell them to put this in their mouth and hold it. When they're studying or something, their mouth tends to drop open. And if they open their mouth, it drops. And that's, that's, a, good, that's a good way of remembering that you, you, you were breathing through, to stay breathing through your nose. You're just that, that simple. And things like that, I feel you can get up to speed in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I honestly do. But, you know, otherwise it took, it would take six months. Absolutely fascinating. Jim, thank you so much for sharing what is likely to be life-saving information. I hope that doctors will share this video with their teams and also with their colleagues. Oh, thank you, Tom. This was really my pleasure. And I, I just, I love this stuff. It's just changed my life. I'm 72. I was able to get up for a year. I, I've lost uh, lots of weight. Um, and I was never an athlete ever in my life. And now I enjoy a run, which is amazing to me. We do about 80 flights of stairs in uh, about three miles whenever we go to the park. So you can go to the park and do some things. You can get outside and be like, like I said, a true play. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll chat again soon. Thank you, Tom.